Okay, around this way. They changed the back corners. Welcome to, to everybody. It's a great pleasure to have Michael Bain uh, with us. I wanted him to come for a long, uh, for a long time already uh, to present here the anti-Semitism in one of the countries which unfortunately is uh, in leaders in the, in the field. Uh, a lot of things have happened since, uh, since the last uh, time we met a few weeks ago. It now goes extremely fast in Europe. The polls keep coming out, uh, which show how deep-rooted anti-Semitism in Europe is. Not only the anti-Israelism, but uh, as they say, but uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, as we have always claimed, they are totally, uh, they are almost, in fact, uh, identical. You find all the, all the classical religious political uh, prejudices confirmed in all these polls. The last one two days ago, from the Corriere della Sera in Italy, in nine European countries. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, another interesting event is in France, a book has come out by a philosopher, and we must unfortunately now say, fortunately, by a non-Jew, who uh, speaks about the, the criminal inclinations of democratic Europe. Milner's book uh, has made, at least in France, uh, substantial headlines because he shows how in democratic Europe uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the racist, anti in particular, anti-Semitic uh, ideas uh, are deeply rooted. Uh, Milner uh, says that, in fact, he claims that Europe and the Jews, the Europe and the Jewish tradition are incompatible. They cannot coexist uh, peacefully due to the barbaric character of uh, Europe. Uh, we have, of course, seen the other thing we have seen is not very smart, <coughs> the attack of the World Jewish Congress on the European Commission, which they had then to eat themselves, not because they were wrong, I think they were totally right. I am convinced that the, you have in Europe a phenomenon which I call hermaphrodite anti-Semitism. The Europeans are both the arsonists and the firemen. With the one hand, the European Commission has fired the anti-Semitism with its endless uh, one-sided attacks on Israel, and now, uh, with the other hand, it tries to put it out. We at the center have also been quite busy. We have had a number of publications. Jewish Political Studies Review uh, came out a few weeks ago, devoted to anti-Semitism, my book on Europe's crumbling myths, on how the today's anti-Semitism in Europe uh, is rooted in the democratic societies after the Shoah, uh, came out a few weeks ago. Yesterday, this came out, joint publication of the Jerusalem Center with the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Minister Sharansky uh, on the occasion of the day to combat the anti-Semitism. Anti this is material in Hebrew for the Israeli shaliach, for the Israeli industrialists, for any Israeli going abroad who wants to know the basics of the dialogue on how you react if you are confronted with anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. Um, one more remark, please register. It is very difficult. Uh, uh, we have asked you that many times. Uh, if you come 
uh, if you want to participate, these are closed sessions, they are by invitation only, and we want people to register because it's extremely difficult to know how many chairs to, to put in, how to set up, uh, how to set up the room. Uh, in fact, uh, we might have done better today not to have the tables, but we didn't know the, the exact number. So I once again repeat that please register well ahead. It's the only condition for those invited to uh, be, uh, be invited, uh, invited here. And finally, for the journalists, those who write uh, present here, who write about this lecture, please mention that it took place at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Well, and now, Mike, uh, it's a great pleasure really to, to have you here. I, as we, we, we know, uh, Mike has also written an essay in this book, which a new anti-Semitism with defining Judeophobia in 21st century Britain, edited by Paul Egansky and Barry Cosmin. It's a book which gives an overview of uh, uh, Judophobia in the 21st century Br uh, Britain, uh, which uh, deals with both anti-Semitism, terrorism in the UK, and unfortunately, it is uh, it's quite uh, it's quite a lengthy book, and it doesn't cover everything. Uh, we have seen also increase in violence against Jews in Britain, the elite anti-Semitism, universities in Britain, the, whole, the academic boycott, of course, campaign started, not surprisingly, by two Jews, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hillary, uh, Hillary and what's his name? Stephen. Hillary and Stephen Rose, two uh, not very prominent uh, Jewish professors who became famous because they started to, uh, the boycott against uh, Israel. And in a certain way, and certainly there, I would say Brit Britain now leads the uh, Europe in uh, in certain things of certain facets of anti-Semitism. Uh, Mike uh, holds a central position in this battle against the anti-Semitism. The UK, you have the Community Security Trust, which deals with the security safety of uh, the uh, British Jewish communities. It's communications director, he's the director of the defense and group relations divisions of the board of deputies of British Jews. He's the roof body of the, of the Jews in the UK, and he's also a consultant to the European Jewish Congress. The next lecture, by the way, you, uh, we have published new PNAs, and we have published new Jerusalem viewpoints. We have published Trevor Assassin's analysis of the BBC, which is, in my opinion, the most <coughs> outstanding uh, analysis I have ever seen of media bias against Israel. You can find it outside. We have published latest PNA on the use of language by against the Jews in anti-Semitism by George Elia Safati, who has spoken here in French in the center a few uh, a few uh, weeks uh, a few months ago. We have Trevor Esselson on the tents. Uh, please register for that. And we have uh, Abe Foxman of the ADL on the 23rd. Well, Mike, now it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Manfred. Um, in a sense, I feel that I need, ne I need not have come. Um, last week's Jewish Chronicle, uh, ICM poll, and the uh, comment in the Times, uh, the joint letter uh, in yesterday's times by the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and the Cardinal Archbishop uh, and the Jewish Chronicle uh, and the comment on that in a sense uh, could have provided you with a very good uh, but brief overview of the situation in Britain and all I needed to have done in fact was to have read that out to you but uh, you came on an outing and I suppose you want to hear uh, something anyway so um, what I propose to do is to talk for about half an hour or so, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some questions. Um, don't please feel inhibited in any way uh, in asking your questions. Inevitably, I will raise some issues uh, that will, I hope, uh, be provocative uh, and which will spark off things in your minds. Uh, so please uh, feel free to ask me anything you want. Uh, about, about both what I'm saying uh, and uh, anything else to do with this situation uh, that I'm addressing. Let me start by saying 
that in many respects, Britain falls midway between America and Europe, and anti-Semitism is one of these. Politics and many of our attitudes seem to sit midway between the two continents. So our judicial and our political responses to hate reflect both the European formalized constitutionalist approach with laws banning extremist behavior and the American rather more free speech approach. Historically, Britain has not been an arena for violent anti-Semitism other than in medieval times. The Crusades, the Inquisition, and the Holocaust did not affect British Jews directly. And British political parties do not have the same tradition of anti-Semitism that those in continental Europe had. During the interwar years, Nazi and fascist ideologies never really took on in Britain. Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists never came remotely near to gaining power, let alone having a member elected to Parliament or to any municipality. However, having said that, it's worth remembering that ritual murder and the blood libel originated in medieval Britain, and Jews were expelled for a period of several hundred years. After their readmittance in 1656, Britain did not really discriminate against Jews other than in the social sphere until 1905, when it sought to limit the influx of Jews fleeing pogroms and poverty in Russia and Poland by passing the Aliens Act. Jews were never denied their place in society after the hard political emancipation struggle that took place during the Victorian era. This is not to say that the popular image of the Jew, particularly in literature, was not a negative one. It was, and our most enduring literary images of ugly Jews come from Shakespeare, from Marlowe, Trollope, Dickens. But at the same time, you can also find positive images which almost counterbalance these, such as in the works of Disraeli, Walter Scott, George Eliot. So I think it's rather more that Britain tolerated its Jews, perhaps rather disdainfully, after their readmittance. It's interesting to note that a considerable portion of the descendants of the original Sephardim, and indeed of the German Jews that came to Britain in the early 19th century, intermarried to an unacknowledged and substantial extent, even with the British aristocracy and with the royal family. Lord Mountbatten's wife Edwina, the Princess Royal's husband, Princess Margaret's husband, first husband, were all descended uh, from early, from the only, early husband, uh, all descended from early Jewish immigrants. This suggests some degree of tolerance, if not acceptance. In the post-war years, there's been no barriers to Jews reaching the highest positions in government, the armed forces, business and the law. At one time recently, both the head of the criminal and civil jurisdiction of the law were practicing Jews. And even the current Attorney General is likewise a practicing Jew. It's even possible that the next Conservative Prime Minister, his Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Chairman of his party and his senior policy advisor will all be practicing Jews. The social and political anti-Semitism that characterized Britain up to the early 20th century is now also virtually a thing of the past. The anti-Semitism of the golf and tennis club and the city have all but disappeared. One can ask oneself why this is the case, and I think the answer lies both in the reaction to the Holocaust, the birth of Israel, and a more muscular and self-confident Judaism that came with its improving socio-economic position. The 2001 census, released last February, showed that 267,000 respondents identified themselves as Jews. We know that the strictly orthodox community, the heretic community, declined to answer the question on religion. The first time such a question had been included in the national census. And adding their known size to an estimate of those who regard themselves as religiously unaffiliated gives a figure of somewhere between 350, 400,000 Jews. The higher figure is the one suggested by the Institute for Jewish Policy Research, who with the Board of Deputies Demographic Unit have been measuring and analyzing the community and its institution for many years. According to the JPR, the above average socio-economic status of British Jewry is a consequence of its highly educated membership with a high proportion of university graduates. 54% of working men and 50% of working women are in professional occupations, compared with approximately 10% of men and 8% of women in the, in the population as a whole. A further 25% and 16% of women in the age group 18 to 64 who are out economically active are in managerial or senior managerial posts. 
one unofficial estimate given to me while preparing this paper, put the average income of a Jewish family as three times that of other British families. The Jewish community maintains 2,000 voluntary, charitable and non-profit institutions, largely founded in the Victorian period, which provide the complete range of welfare, housing, human service, educational, cultural and recreational services. Again, according to the JPR, the Jewish voluntary sector has a turnover six times the expected size according to the Jewish proportion of the national population. As far as affiliation is concerned, 55% of the Jewish population rate themselves extremely conscious of being Jewish or quite strongly Jewish. Support for Israel is a key component of Jewish identity in Britain. The JPR survey of social and political attitudes of British Jews carried out in 1995 showed 43% of respondents reporting a strong attachment to Israel with 38% showing a moderate attachment. Only 3% had negative feelings towards Israel. The same survey also looked at the relationship between attachment to Israel and Jewish identity and attachment to Britain. And 54% of respondents felt equally British and Jewish, with 26% feeling more Jewish than British, and only 18% responding that they felt more British than Jewish. <coughs> Nearly 70% of respondents reported that they had close friends or family in Israel, and this attachment is manifest in visits to the country, with 78% stating they had visited Israel at least once, with many making multiple visits. Even during the last three difficult years, British Jewry retains its close identi identification with Israel, maintaining a high level of visits. Another marked feature, both to increase group identification and self-confidence, has been the growth in the number of children attending Jewish state and independent schools. The number of pupils attending these has increased fivefold since the 1950s, and now more than half of all Jewish children receive their schooling in a Jewish day school. And it's no exaggeration to say that nearly all the others attend fee-paying private schools. So in so many public fields, Jews take the lead. When the media wants a moral voice to pronounce on something, it's turned to the late Lord Jakobovitz and the current Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Two of the most prominent and universally popular broadcasters have been Rabbis Lionel Blue and the late Hugo Grin. The disproportionate presence of Jews in business, the law, medicine <coughs> and the media have also provided enormous benefits for the community. Many of Britain's most popular and successful businesses were founded by Jews. I think so Marks and Spencers, Burton's, British Home Stores, ICI, Tesco, Amstrad, Shell and even Sainsbury's. Looking at the number of Jews in the higher ranks of the law, High Court and Appeal Court judges once tempted to see the truth in the late Lord Hailsham's comment made during his time as Attorney General that the establishment had to limit the number of Jews appointed to the bench lest it be composed entirely of Jews. That's a snapshot seen from the Jewish viewpoint. Seen from the other side, and again on a more positive note, I would suggest that Britain has done more to promote current Jewish concerns than many other countries. The British government has taken seriously its responsibilities for commemoration of the Holocaust. Teaching the Holocaust has been part of the national history curriculum for all school pupils for many years. Holocaust Memorial Day is slowly becoming a national institution with strong government backing and funding, with a commitment to televise the main five yearly commemorative service on the BBC. In fact, this week, in the media, uh, electronic and printed has been full of uh, Holocaust Memorial articles and, and programs. The work done by the government funded and owned Holocaust Museum, the Anne Frank Trust, the privately owned Beth Shalom in teaching history teachers and school children about the Holocaust are beginning to have a real effect. The Holocaust Education Trust now takes teachers and high school students, not Jewish, from around the country regularly to Auschwitz. And a recent example of this caring concern was the presence of senior government figures at the unveiling of the statue commemorating the kinder transport at Liverpool Street Station a few months ago. An important milestone in this beneficial process, which has removed anti-Jewish discrimination, uh, such as it was, was the 1964 and then the 1976 Race Relations Acts and the legislation which followed them. These not only forbade discrimination, but positively encouraged equal treatment and opportunities for all. The legislation which followed the judicial inquiry into the killing of black teenager Stephen Lawrence cemented and made more workable <coughs> the previous legislation. 
It's not to say that there isn't racism in British society. There is. But the Jewish community has benefited, perhaps to a greater extent than any other, um, from these changes in legislation. And it was the Jewish community that above all fought for the initial legislation. And indeed, in part, the Race Relations Act owes its genesis to the research and lobbying done by the Board of Deputies of British Jews. If all this is the case, then what's changed? And why do we now talk about anti-Semitism in Britain? Why are the newspapers and television screens full of pieces about it? Why three weeks ago did the Times print prominently a letter from a lady living in Cheshire who wrote that she had to hide, hide her mug and David necklace when she went out for fear of being attacked? And this on a page devoted to comment on anti-Semitism. Well, perhaps last week's ICM poll published in the Jewish Chronicle provides some answers. In response to the question, do Jews make a positive contribution to political, social and cultural life in Britain? 23% strongly agreed, 37% agreed, and 44% declared themselves neutral. They didn't know. Only 20% disagreed, of which 11% strongly disagreed. In response to the question, do Jews have too much influence? 31% strongly disagreed, 44% declared themselves neutral. Sorry, 47% disagreed and 35% didn't know. Only 18% agreed that Jews had too much influence, of which 8% strongly agreed. In response to the question, would a British Jew make an equally acceptable Prime Minister as a member of any other faith? 40% strongly agreed, 53% agreed, and 28% declared themselves neutral. Only 18% disagreed, of which 11% strongly disagreed. In response to the fourth and last question, has the scale of the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews during the Second World War been exaggerated? 62% strongly disagreed, 70% disagreed, and 15% declared themselves neutral. Only 15% agreed, of which 10% strongly agreed. In other words, 81% believe that Jews make a positive contribution to Britain or were neutral. Only 18% believe Jews have too much influence. Only 18% don't think that a Jew would be as acceptable as any other to be a Prime Minister. And only 15% believe the scale of the Holocaust has been exaggerated. The bias against Jews is strongest amongst working class pensioners. Given that it's only the 65-year-olds and older who live through the war, this is surprising. But again, looked at from the other side, and on the other hand, it does tend to suggest that teaching the Holocaust to young people now two or three generations removed from that era, and with a much more multinational and diverse population, is having some beneficial effect. Compared with other recent polls, it shows, I think, uh, quite clearly, that Britain is better in this respect than other European countries. But there's still a problem. And the problems which now face the community are those which did not previously exist. Firstly, the overspill of the Israel-Palestine conflict. <coughs> Secondly, the growth of the Muslim community and the parallel growth of Islamist militant ideology. And thirdly, the recent resurrection of the far left and its reactions to globalization. Again, with all these influences, the effect is more muted in Britain than elsewhere in continental Europe. The attitude of the church, at least until recently, has also been important. But Anglicanism provided fewer barriers than Catholicism or orthodoxy to the advancement of Jews in society, and indeed contained a strong strain of Zionism in Victorian and Edwardian times. For the sake of accuracy, it's also important to record there was a strain of anti-Semitism within the upper echelons of British society, and indeed it played a part behind the Balfour Declaration and the continuing um, high level, uh, I mean high society level uh, of anti-Semitism. But at grassroots and on the margins, particularly in Scotland and Wales, where it retains some measure of influence, its attitudes to Israel have been swayed by the Palestinian church and to some extent by Palestinian liberation theology, although the Church of England rejects replacement theology. Can we measure the scale of anti-Jewish attitudes in other ways? I think we can. Certainly we can measure the physical manifestations of anti-Semitism as incidents, and this we've been doing since 1984. Secondly, we can at least analyse and explain 
social, intellectual and political antisemitism. As far as incidents are concerned, there have been substantial fluctuations in reaction to international events since October 2000. How do we measure incidents? Well, over the years, the Community Security Trust has firstly encouraged members of the Jewish community to report incidents to us. Secondly, we have universal press coverage, which means we see every article, every letter about anti-Semitism. Thirdly, we liaise with the police in London and around the country. By being appointed what's called third-party reporters, we are able to both report anti-Semitic incidents